only uh, in the sense that it is a, a a window into our deep past, into the past of the Stone Age. And Graham, why don't you set the scene for us a little bit? And we're going to talk about a lot of things today. Yeah. Uh, beside beyond that, uh, but what got you into this period and writing about it? Well, see, when when I was researching my last uh, nonfiction book, which was which was Supernatural. The mystery that that grabbed me when I was researching Supernatural was um, was this uh, really transformative moment in the in the human story, uh, when when after literally you know millions of years of, of dull, unimaginative, non-symbolic, non-creative, and non-spiritual behavior, our ancestors just seem seem to suddenly wake up. Uh, all around the world, and 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 we can witness their awakening by the incredible art that they begin to cre- create. You know, they've been they've been doing no art. They don't show any sign of of symbolic ability before, and then just suddenly they're creating this this extraordinary art. art Brilliant art. In art the, that was you know was so amazing that that uh, pa- Pablo Picasso, when he when he first saw the cave of Lascaux in France, he he came out and he said, well, frankly, we've invented nothing. These ancients uh, knew it all. Everything, every technique we have today. They had it, and but it was a miracle because it it dawned, you know, literally overnight. And and um, uh, what the, there are certain characteristics of the art, to cut a long story short, which which make it clear that that uh, shamanism was involved. And when we speak of shamanism, we speak of altered states of consciousness, uh, which might be induced by a whole range of different techniques, from fasting to rhythmic dancing to visionary plants. Um, and and uh, witnessing and overlooking uh, all these incredible underground cathedrals in southern France and Spain and the rock art uh, that we indeed find uh, all around the world are, are images of beings, entities that we do not ever encounter in everyday life. And, and these are often uh, in a form that is part, uh, part animal and, and part uh, human, uh, a bison man or a lion man. Uh, and frequently the art shows that creature as caught in the moment of transformation. It's not somebody dressed up in skins. You can see that the the being is actually transforming uh, between human and animal forms, a, a shapeshifter, uh, if you like. And and um, this really intrigued me. Um, what, was it was it possible that that our our ancestral shamans in altered states of consciousness were were gaining contact with other realms and other levels of reality and the intelligent uh, entities that inhabit them, but that are not normally uh, accessible to our senses. So, so this was the mystery that I investigated in Supernatural, and in investigating it, um, I thought it was important to really get to grips with shamanism, and that meant going down to the Amazon and uh, working with shamans and drinking the, the powerful visionary brew there that they call ayahuasca, uh, the vine of souls, and entering these deeply altered states of consciousness uh, myself. Oh, my. I, I don't have the nerve to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you, I was once in a room where people were smoking marijuana, and I was—I had hallucinations for a week. <laughs> I think you're—you're you're a highly—you're a highly sensitive and attuned uh, guy. With yeah, you. yeah. I, I think I don't need to spend the money. But tell us about ayahuasca. I'm so fascinated and so tempted. Often, I have to say. Well, it's an extraordinary thing. They—they—it's they, not thought of as as any kind of drug uh, in the in the Amazon or indeed uh, in the wider world because ayahuasca is spreading around the world. Now it's thought of as a medicine. Yeah, well, not everybody is crazy. I mean, you know, this country has got an, a bug in its ear about these things. So. That's right. But interestingly, even in this country, um, thanks to the constitutional protection of freedom of religion, um, two of the Brazilian uh, syncretic churches, which mix uh, elements of Christianity with elements of traditional shamanism, the Unia de Vegetal and the Santo Deme, have been granted exemptions by the Supreme Court. Um, and allowed uh, to drink ayahuasca, which, by the way, contains dimethyltryptamine, DMT, which is a Schedule One drug in the United States. They've been granted exemptions because it's been recognized that drinking ayahuasca uh, is their sacrament, and it is their means uh, to make direct contact uh, with the spirit realm. And this is so in California, and it's so in Oregon, and it's so in New Mexico now. Um, so, 
you know, the, this vine from the Amazon jungle is actually reaching out and, and, and spreading across the world. And, and our society has so locked people down uh, into the material reductionist uh, reference frame and so convinced people that there is nothing more to reality than, than the material world and, that, and our physical bodies. There's no more to us than our physical bodies. This is the, the conviction of Western science, although it's actually based on no evidence uh, whatsoever. And ayahuasca, um, by, by plunging us into seamlessly convincing uh, parallel realms, more real than real, um, is, yes. Is is is, is I, I believe it's helping many people to to reconnect with uh, with with spirit. Well, in 2007, I in, interviewed Rick Strassman, the author of DMT, the Spirit Molecule. Wonderful book. Yeah, and he said that his discovery was that the, the people he was experimenting with legally, in other words, he had permission from the FDA to do these experiments. Exactly. Uh, we're all entering the same realm. Yes. And he said it's a real place. Yes, exactly. This is, Did you enter it? Uh, yes, def- definitely. Oh tell I, us, tell us about I've it. Also, I'm fascinated. I've also taken uh, DMT in pure form and in the form of uh, of ayahuasca, where it's integrated with other elements. Um, and and um, well, there's two el- there's two elements to these uh, experiences. The ayahuasca experience is more long drawn out than the pure DMT experience, and it involves uh, three to four, sometimes five hours of journeying, uh, whereas DMT taken on its own can be a matter of 12 or 14 minutes, and that doesn't give you a lot of time to process the experience. But with ayahuasca, it does. And and two uh, two aspects of it. One is um, a kind of personal healing, uh, which may go on uh, across several sessions where ayahuasca helps you to identify uh, aspects of your character and your behavior that, that really need some work. Uh, and, and I would call it tough love. I mean, it, it, it showed me uh, aspects of my own behavior that were really not helpful to other people and that were causing pain to others. It showed me that in a very stark um, and, 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 and absolutely clear manner. I couldn't hide behind any illusions. And, and this was a great opportunity to me because I, I was then able to see myself as I really was and, and to do something about, for example, my, 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 my bad temper, uh, my, my arrogance, my hastiness, uh, to fix all of that. Uh, give me, it's not easy to change the lifetime of bad habits, but, but no. once, you, once you have the insight, uh, at least you have the, the opportunity. And, and many have found this aspect of ayahuasca incredibly important in, in self-healing. And, and not only in terms of one's behavior, but, but, um, but, but, but very often, uh, and I know this sounds really, really quite mystical, but there's an astonishing amount of evidence for this. I, I, ayahuasca brings uh, healing to physical ailments uh, also. Quite extraordinary uh, in this effect. I'm not saying it happens every time, but there have been extraordinary cases of remissions from terminal cancer uh, with, uh, with ayahuasca. Um, and and in, in, in my case, uh, enormously helpful in dealing with um, a lifetime of severe uh, migraine headaches, which have been greatly reduced since I worked with uh, with ayahuasca. But then, wow. the, the, it, it's really quite quite an extraordinary thing. And what we have to remember is that shamans in the Amazon have been working with this brew. It is a foul tasting brew. One should not imagine that that it's uh, anybody would do this for kicks. Um, and 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 there are some side effects, vomiting and uh, and diarrhea, which you have to, oh. which you have to deal with. But shamans have been working with this brew for thousands and thousands of years, and what they tell us, and I believe we should listen to what they say, is that an intelligent being lies behind the brew, and that she uses the brew to make contact with human consciousness, and that she is all love, that she her business is the planet, and and. And uh, the, the the great jungles and and, and 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 oceans and prairies of our planet. But she she is the the keeping spirit, the, the the mother goddess of our planet in a sense. And and that part of her her mission is to reach out to to human beings, to this this powerful and misguided species called humanity that lives on planet Earth. And yes. And and teach us to uh, to to fulfil our responsibilities and to recognise. Um, to recognize the divine part of of ourselves and and um, and she does that and she's done that for 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 many many people who i know and 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 shamans are very conscious of this and they're also very clear that this entity is uh, is female 
Um, Interesting. It, it's as if it's the planet itself. Yes. It's, and it's, and it's, then you're seeing what is reflected in Entangled, by the way, which vividly, I mean very vividly, folks, evokes this world of the distant past and uh, it's about what was actually happening then as Graham has come to understand it. And, you know, I always get these people who say, oh, I only read nonfiction. This, this is different. It's like the books I've been writing that are fiction, but with a, with, with, with something behind it. It's not entirely imaginary. It's a very carefully imagined piece and you get an incredible visionary look into this world, Graham. I I, th I couldn't believe you could write such a marvelous novel. Well, thank you, Whitney. Yeah, thank so, you for that. And I and I and I have to tell you that that I I didn't know I could write a novel either. This was a gift to me from uh, Mother Ayahuasca. Uh, I well, after I finished that last nonfiction book, Supernatural, um, I felt an inner voice really told me that it was time for me to change direction. I had been working for more than 20 years on, on issues of lost civilizations and the possibility of a great forgotten episode in human history. I would branched into <clears throat> shamanism and altered states of consciousness in Supernatural, but I was still um, putting up the same <clears throat> massive architecture of facts and footnotes uh, writing uh, perhaps defensively to make sure that academics couldn't find a, uh, a little gap in the armor of the argument to, to work through and discredit the whole thing as, as academics love to do. And then you found out that if they can't find a gap, they'll make one up. They'll make one up, Ex right. exactly. Yeah, and I was, I was tired of, 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 of 20 years of, of struggle with, with bitter and furious um, and envious uh, academics. Yes. I, I felt I wanted to, to stretch my narrative gifts in other in other directions and, 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 and to write a work of fiction. So I, I went down to Brazil and, I, and I, for two weeks, I, I, over a period of two weeks, I had five sessions of ayahuasca and I asked the spirits of ayahuasca um, to show me if I could do this and, and um, if, if possible, um, what, what I should write. And uh, amazingly, I, I just had the most extraordinary transformative uh, series of experiences. In which Let me ask you a frank question. Yeah. I, I wasn't going to ask this, but I'm just going to blurt it out. Do you think you channeled actual events from the distant past in this? Yes. I do, too. I, I, I honestly do. I, I, do. I, I wasn't going to say it, but I do too. Well, thank you, Whitley, for seeing that because there's there's something there's something very curious has gone on with uh, with this novel, um, which which really <clears throat> gives me goosebumps sometimes. Um, and I'm not I'm not saying that this is any virtue in me. I think I was simply acting as a channel um, for the for the inspiring spirit uh, of of, uh, of ayahuasca and what she shows, which is always the truth. And uh, in a number of cases, for example... Which is the, it, it's a novel about the moment the earth woke man up, yes. really, basically. Yes, it's an, and it's a novel about uh, good and evil. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and, and it's a novel about time, and about how time may be very different, because my two principal characters, one of them lives 24,000 years ago in the Stone Age, and she's a young woman. Uh, named Rhea, right. and the other character is also a young woman named Leone, who lives in 21st century uh, Los Angeles. It, right, and, and I, I had the feeling that it was you and someone from the past. In other words, that you are Leone in a sense. In a sense. Yeah. But, but let me we're going you. to, speaking of sense, we're going to make some sense right now in a different way, because we're taking a little break, and we'll be right back with Graham Hancock. Subscribers, at the end of this month, we're going to be moving to a new version of unknowncountry.com with lots of new features and interesting new ways of looking at what we have. We found by polling you that most of you are not really aware of just how deep the subscriber section of Unknown Country goes, but you'll be able to find everything that's there very easily in the new system. We're very excited about it, and of course, if you have questions about it and difficulty, write subscribers at unknowncountry.com and you will get an immediate response from our subscriber section. Please do not attempt to phone them because most of the problems that are connected with use of a website like this involve links, and you can't very well repeat links over a telephone. So do write subscribers at unknowncountry.com if you have trouble, and I don't think you will. 
It's going to be a very smooth transition. The site will be down for a few days during the transition. You'll see that listed on the page. And we're excited. We're going to be the best of our kind and the biggest of our kind as soon as we finish this transition. Also, subscribers, we're offering a special discount on the 2011 Crop Circle calendar for our subscribers. The discount coupon code is CCSUB3. That's CCSUB3. And it gets you $4 off the list price. And remember, our shipping charges are much, much lower, more than 50% off what they used to be. So you can go to the unknowncountry.com store and get your calendar right away. We're talking to Graham Hancock, his new book, Entangled, one of the great thinkers and authors of our time. And uh, Graham, go right ahead. If you can pick up your thought. Yes. The, uh, good. Go right so, ahead. So, so the, essential, the essential elements of the plot that were given to me um, in a, a series of uh, ayahuasca visions in, in Brazil were two young women, um, one who I call Ria who lived 24,000 years ago in the Stone Age, one who I call Leone, who's an American who lives in modern uh, Los Angeles in the 21st century. And both of these young women are, are deeply interconnected. Time, as we understand it, is an illusion. It is not a straight line. It's not an arrow from past to present to future. Uh, different epochs and cycles of time are all bound together and cross one another and, 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 and intersect. Um, and once we leave the confines of the physical body, uh, it becomes possible to travel not only in space but, uh, but, but also in time. So the vehicle that I use to bring these two young women into contact with one another and their connection is absolutely vital because they, uh, they must join forces to really to do battle with a demon who travels through time and who is seeking to, uh, to, to destroy all that is wonderful and good uh, in, in humanity. The mechanism by which these two young women gain contact with one another is through altered states of consciousness, not a time machine, but altered states of consciousness. And in the first case, Leone, uh, the modern character, first uh, makes contact with, with Rhea, the ancient character, during a near-death experience. Leone uh, overdoses on, on uh, OxyContin and, and actually dies and um, has, is brought back to life. But during the near-death experience, she has her first encounter not only with Rhea, but also with the supernatural being who I call the Blue Angel. Uh, yes. Very much, very much the, the spirit of our planet. Now, let me ask you this. Has this happened to you? I've had a direct contact with, uh, with the spirit of ayahuasca. Yes, I know. <laughs> very, very direct <laughs> but contact. Tell us about it, because well, it's, it's, it's so interesting the way you transferred or transformed your life experience into this book. Go ahead. Well, yes. I, I mean, what what uh, what, what happened? I've, I've had more than uh, thirty sessions with uh, with ayahuasca now, um, but uh, on on one of those sessions uh, in particular, I met the entity who all the shamans in the Amazon will tell you uh, lies behind the ayahuasca brew, uh, and she appeared to me in the form of a of a great uh, serpent. Now, I, I know that, that many of a fundamentalist Christian persuasion will, will imagine that any serpentine being must be evil and must be connected with the devil. Um, but this was an uh, entity... Who cares what they think? Who cares what they think? And, and uh, this was an entity of pure, uh, of pure love. I was at a point in my life, I was very low, I was very discouraged, I was having very negative thoughts about myself. And she appeared to me and, and during an ayahuasca session, and I felt this huge serpent just wrap her coils around my body and lay this gigantic head on my shoulder and looked into my eyes for two hours without stopping, sending me energy, sending me love, sending me hope, telling me that it was okay to feel good about myself and that if I didn't feel good about myself I couldn't feel good about anything else either it was a direct contact with a powerful spiritual being and I found myself I found myself amazed that a that that, that a creature whose whose business is the planet uh, would have uh, time um, to to spend on me and to and to give me uh, reassurance and strength and healing so this this um, the entity that I describe as the blue angel or Our Lady of the Forest, she's also known by that name, in my novel Entangled, is, of course, close, closely modeled uh, on the spirit of, of ayahuasca. And what the, the, the Blue Angel, 
um, is uh, locked in conflict with a demonic force, her absolute opposite, who seeks to bring down darkness on the human race, who seeks to minimize all our potential, who seeks to lead us astray into acts of cruelty and, and, and viciousness and horror. Um, and, and, uh, but, the, but the Blue Angel cannot intervene directly in the physical realm. The only way that she can intervene is to work through human consciousness and help human beings to see that it is their responsibility and their duty uh, to do battle with this demon, not only in the Stone Age, but also in the 21st century, because he's present in both time frames. And that's why she brings together these two young women, uh, Rhea and Leone, who are the heroes of the story, and who through struggle and overcoming their own uh, weaknesses and, and difficulties, uh, and through courage, will ultimately defeat uh, this, this evil force and, and give humanity a chance. And what's the jeopardy, what's at the heart uh, of the story uh, is the fate of the Neanderthal. Rhea is an anatomically modern human being like you and I, but living at the same time as her, 24,000 years ago, are the last of the Neanderthals. And I present them in the novel as, as, as I was shown in my visions, as, as beings of pure love. They may, they may look ugly by our standards, like Rhea's people call them the uglies, but they are beauty and truth inside. They don't speak, they communicate telepathically, they are, they are caring and loving and, and uh, bring gentleness and, and warmth to the universe. And, and you, you do know, Graham, mm. that, that, that this very picture of them has just been confirmed scientifically in the past few weeks. Absolutely. This was the point that I wanted to make and an eerie aspect of writing the story. So when I'm writing the story, Two, two, three years ago now, I'm, I'm depicting the Neanderthals this way, and I also, it suddenly came to me that they have red hair. So I said, okay, the Neanderthals red hair. It came to me that there could be love between them and, and human beings, and I, and I consider that possibility in the novel uh, as well. And amazingly, uh, a couple of years after I'd written this, the evidence came out that the Neanderthals did have red hair, uh, and as, as we've recently discovered, that they did interbreed with human beings. In fact, 4% of all modern human genes are owed to our connections with the Neanderthals. And the I, I'll bet our connections to the numinous world come from those genes. This book is like the voice of the Neanderthals speaking across time through Graham's pen. It, 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 they come to life in a way in this that's really almost miraculous. Go ahead. Well, thank you. This was uh, th this was important, and as you rightly say, uh, the latest evidence we're, we're we're talking now in October 2010. The latest evidence that's come out just in the last week or so uh, has been absolute proof that the Neanderthals were incredible. You know, we use the word Neanderthal to, to, to in, in our language today to describe a sort of brutish, unthinking, uncaring being, but actually the new evidence that's come out. Uh, is that they were caring, considerate, loving. There's been examples of, of, of long-term care for the elderly amongst the Neanderthals. We can tell this from surviving skeletal remains of individuals who were badly injured and who were nurtured and supported by their community for many years after this crippling in injury. Uh, individuals who were blind, uh, who again were looked after by their community. So modern science is now beginning to understand that the Neanderthals were pure love. Um, and oddly, this was what I was given to tell in my novel before this information uh, ever came out. And that's why I think you're right. In this download, I downloaded truth. And, and the, the jeopardy is, we know the Neanderthals became extinct. But the demonic force, who I call Sulpa in the Stone Age, who's seeking to take a human body in the 21st century, the psychic energy that he needs for that, he will derive by persuading human beings Modern, anatomically modern human beings like Rhea, by persuading them to exterminate the Neanderthals. And, and Rhea's role in this story is to stop him. She has to stop this demon from doing that. Human be whatever happens, however the Neanderthals become extinct, it must not be because modern humans like you and I, anatomically modern humans, wipe them out. There must be some, there must be some other reason. And, and again, we get into a, a whole different view of what, of what time is. Uh, which is another another area that this novel has connected with the latest science because new quantum physics is suggesting that influences in time may not only flow forward but also back. We're going to take another very brief break, and when we come back, we're going to ask Graham what his understanding of these demons are because they have played a pretty big role 
in our lives and our world, but not apparently in that of the Neanderthals. Why? We'll be right back. We're talking to Graham Hancock, his incredible new book, Entangled. Don't miss it. It is really, really something very special, somehow channeled, connected in a real way to the incredibly distant human past of 24,000 years ago, containing a new vision of the Neanderthals, which just this week has been confirmed by science. And Graham gained this through his journeys with ayahuasca long before the scientific community found out that it was true. And in the book, there is a demonic presence that seeks to get the Cro-Magnons, the modern version of man, to exterminate the Neanderthals. And Graham, can you tell us more, a little more about your impression of what this is? Because it's real. It's real. Um, I, I, I believe, as, as, as shamans do uh, all around the world, that we are, uh, we are interconnected with other realms and dimensions, whether we like it or not. We may not see them, we may not be aware of them with our physical senses, although some of us are more sensitive than others. Um, but, but interpenetrating our world and influencing it uh, all the time are, are entities of spirit. And the spirit world is, is not all goodness. There is, there is evil and dark out there. In a sense, mankind is the fulcrum of a cosmic struggle uh, between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. And it's not an accident that every human culture down the ages has recognized uh, the beings that we would call angels and demons. And that the, demon, the demonic role is to mislead <coughs> and misguide humanity uh, and take us down a dark path and thus perhaps to plunge the whole universe in darkness because we should not underestimate our importance as creatures who are part matter and part uh, spirit. And I felt, I felt very, very powerfully energized, although it was difficult for me to write the dark passages in Entangled. Uh, I felt powerfully energized to show that this, that this darkness is real and that it is a danger to human beings, that we must uh, take it seriously and that it's through love and it's through courage and it's through, through the virtues of, 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 of human decency and, 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 and concern and love for one another that we can defeat this force. And that's why, why, my, why my two young uh, woman characters, Rhea, Rhea and Leonia, are brought together. Uh, to, to do battle with this creature and with his emissaries amongst, um, amongst humanity uh, to allow the light to continue to shine and, and, and to make sure uh, in the Stone Age that however the, the extinction of the Neanderthals comes, it is not brought about by the actions of, uh, of human beings. And this involves great uh, battles. And the, the story is an adventure story. Uh, as well as being, as well as being a vehicle for uh, expressing extraordinary ideas, I felt it was very important for, for me as a writer. I think I do believe the first, the first responsibility of a novelist is not to bore the reader. The reader must be wanting to turn the pages, and 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 I hope that I've written. I wasn't bored at all. <laughs> <laughs> I think that should be obvious. But Graham, let me ask you this: uh, Is it possible, do you think, to actually live? In, 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 in consciousness with people whose lives are unfolding in the past. I mean, just sort of forget about linear time. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it is, isn't it? I, I think so too. I, I, I think that all times are unfolding uh, simultaneously and that there are certain portals and intersection points where these times, uh, where these times overlap and events in one time zone have impact and effect on events in other time zones. Um, other periods of history in the distant past, that there's a cycle or a rhythm flowing through history and that our, that our lives are bound up with those who've come before us and those who will come after us. And then what is history about? What are we doing? We're in the process of a grand drama. We're here to learn and to grow and to develop. I often think of, <coughs> of our world, of this, <coughs> excuse me, of this physical realm as a, as a theater uh, of experience. I, I believe that, 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 that uh, the true uh, essence of humanity is consciousness, pure, pure consciousness, and I don't believe that consciousness is, is an 
accidental artifact of our physical bodies. I think that the consciousness pre-exists our physical bodies and chooses to incarnate uh, or immerse itself in physical form. Um, and, and, and in order to learn, because in this realm, in this physical realm, we have jeopardy that may not be present in, in non-physical realms, but ultimately non-physical energy, non-physical consciousness is the essence of existence in my view, and the physical form is a learning uh, experience. We're here to learn and grow and develop, and there are some forces out there, the demons, the darkness, who seek to stop that and to prevent the evolution of the human spirit, to prevent the perfection of the soul. Are they there to harm us or to make us stronger? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question because through through resisting uh, the forces of evil, um, and and you know one point that I that I make in this in in this is novel is that evil can't always be defeated, but it can always be resisted. That's a choice. <laughs> that's a choice, and through making choices. Uh, we define ourselves as, uh, as as beings, and if there were if there were no choice, if everything was pure sweetness and light, with no with no dark side, then perhaps we wouldn't learn and grow and develop as much as we should. And another point to make is that that ultimately, um, to, uh, to 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 defeat the the dark purpose of these entities, we also need to extend some kind of love to them. To extend some kind of love to them, how would we go about doing that? Very difficult. Yeah. <laughs> very, very, very difficult to do. But love is the force that conquers all. Um, I, I, I do believe that. That's what's missing in the world today. That's why the world has become so dark. That's why it's possible to sense, uh, with, without any doubt, demonic forces in uh, at work in the 21st century. Oh yes, uh, and in the 20th, my God. And the 20th century, a century of utter horror, unparalleled in the whole history of the globe. In the whole history of mankind, <laughs> and, and now you have. In the U.S., uh, people running for Congress who dress up as SS officers? Extraordinary. Horrifying really, really beyond extraordinary. belief. We always have this, we always have this choice. And I think it's important for, for people to realize that, that that's the one area where all of us as, as individuals have power. We have power over the choices we make. We better make sure that those choices are for the light, not for the darkness. And an inner voice tells us, what we're doing every time we make a choice. We may ignore that voice, but, but we know whether an action, a word, a gesture was for the light or for the darkness. We all know it. We all know the truth all the time, but sometimes at our peril we ignore it. You know, I knew a woman who was a, a Kabbalist, a very advanced Kabbalist in Poland before World War II, and she said that they had made extraordinary strides in coming into physical contact with the light side and uh, the, the, the good, and they ignored the darkness and yes. pushed it away and even pretended that it didn't exist, yes. and then as a result, it simply rose up behind them all of a sudden and came bounding into the country in the form of these Nazis yes. with, in black uniforms with death's head skulls. Yeah, with the true, them. In, the true incarnation of darkness. In the right, the true country. incarnation of darkness, and and uh, she said it killed everybody. She was lucky to, very lucky to escape with her life. She ended up escaping across uh, Russia and Indo and in and Mongolia and and ended up in uh, Singapore when the Japanese invade. She really had. Uh, when you fight, when you fight the dark, you're fighting for your life. Now, what should they have done with the darkness? She didn't ever t explain that to me, but they must have been something they could have done. Well, sometimes, what, what sometimes when the darkness when the darkness takes human form and misleads millions of human beings with all their skills and ingenuity to to become an agent of misery and, and vicious cruelty in the world, sometimes the only thing you can do is fight back. Sometimes, sometimes it's, it's, not, it's not enough simply to lie down in the path of the darkness. Sometimes you really have to fight. There has to be, there has to be a fight. And, and, and that's what I've tried to show uh, in, in, in Entangled, that the situation had gone too far uh, and that, that the only way it could be brought back was to defeat the demonic forces, as indeed the demonic forces of Hitler were ultimately defeated during the Second World War. Well, perhaps. Uh, if you listen to people like Jim Mars there's, and uh, Joseph Farrell, they're still with us, but just heavily disguised. And well, uh, then I see this guy who's mm -hmm. running for Congress and is found to be dressing up in SS 
uniforms, and I really do wonder if they were defeated. Yeah, that is that is that's a, that's a fair point, Whitley. We have to always be we have to always be on guard. And one of the tricks that darkness plays is to is to disguise itself in uh, in, in in manner we don't really see what's going on. Um, it's a it, it 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 it's an extraordinarily difficult difficult thing. But I would say be guided by the inner voice. Graham and I are going to be talking for subscribers about the huge subject of the lost civilization. The He has written the most important books on this subject ever written by anybody. Fingerprints of the Gods, Underworld, uh, Supernatural, and we're, that's what we're going to be talking about for but, our subscribers. But Whitley, can I add something? Yes, of which course. I would, and this is a, an appeal uh, to my to my readers. Um, I have been, um, I've come to realize that the publishing industry has typecast me as a non-fiction author, and the publishing industry, in its in its own way, is also a dark force. And the publishing industry does not want me uh, to be a novelist. It does not want me to write fiction. Major efforts have been made to to suppress my book. I was not able to find a, a major publisher in the United States, but a but a gutsy smaller publisher called Disinformation Company did take the book on. And what I would ask my readers is, come with me on this journey. Uh, em- empower me to take this new path. Um, don't ignore uh, what I've written because it's a novel. Um, yes, I- I'm don't. really reaching out and asking and asking my my readers of my nonfiction to recognize that that uh, that this is the new path for me, and that I hope that they will find it a nourishing path. Um, but, uh, boy, do I need their support right now. Yes, I know, Bra- uh, Graham. I go through the same thing exactly. And, uh, folks, I cannot agree with him more completely or urge you to get past the illusion that there is something trivial about a book if it's fiction. It's not fiction in the way that James Patterson writes fiction. Believe me, this is another kind of writing. It doesn't even have a name yet. It, they call it fiction, but it's something else. I write it. I know what I'm talking about. He has written a book like this. This is a book that comes from a deeper, more resonant level of consciousness than a n- normal novel. Uh, it is a, it is a really almost a book, I would say, for the ages, and certainly it contains wisdom and contact with beings across the sweep of time that is unlike anything you will come into contact with anywhere else entangled by graham hancock seek it out it's coming from a small publisher in this country uh 